I'm Todd McKay. And I'm Franco Terrazano. And this is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, more accountable government. And in this episode, we're going to talk about Aaron O'Toole winning the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race and the promises he's made for taxpayers. We've had some good talks with him and we want to talk about what he's told us. And in Waste Watch, hundreds of thousands of dollars more have been burned at the Governor General's office. What is going on over there? We're going to talk about that. But before we get into all that, we need to make an apology. And then we want to talk about a new mystery that we've got on our hands. Yeah, okay. So let's start with the apology. A few weeks ago, we told you that Infrastructure Minister Catherine McKenna spent taxpayers' money on photos of her visit to the United Nations for her Instagram account. Now, Minister McKenna's office reached out to us to say that one of her own staffers took those photos uh, to put on her Instagram account. It was a different department that contracted the photographer. Minister McKenna didn't know anything about that. And listen, we've criticized Minister McKenna about many things. She has never complained to us about it. Respectful debate, that's a good thing. We're going to keep doing that. But in this case, we put the blame in the wrong place. And so we got to make that right. Minister McKenna, if you happen to be listening, we're sorry about that. Actually, We'd like to take the apology one step further and thank Minister McKenna for using a staffer instead of hiring an expensive photographer. That saves taxpayers money and our politicians need to be looking everywhere and doing everything possible to save taxpayers money, especially now. We'd like to see more politicians doing just that. Okay, so that takes care of the apology and wanted to get that right out in front. But now we have a mystery. And we got to talk that through. We still have documents that show Global Affairs Canada spent more than $5,000 on a photography contract. And it says right on the documents that part of that contract was taking pictures of Minister McKenna at the UN. We're going to put a link to those documents in the show notes. But that mystery is getting deeper because apparently the minister didn't know anything about the contract and she didn't use the actual photos. She got those photos off her staffer's cell phone. So... What happened to those contracted photos, and why did Global Affairs spend all of that money? You know, we actually did a lot of homework on this. We dug up the documents, we asked Global Affairs about the photos before we ran the story, and we gave the department two weeks to reply. And you know what we got back? All we heard back was crickets. And now it turns out that the minister didn't know anything about the photos. Yeah, so we've gone back to Global Affairs to ask why the department spent thousands of dollars on a photographer and what did it use the photos for? Honestly, this actually seems like an even bigger waste of money now because the minister clearly didn't need the photos. So what was Global Affairs doing? Why was it spending all of this money on a photo contract? We're still waiting. We're still waiting for you, Global Affairs. Get back to us on this one. In the meantime, we have filed a bunch more access to information requests to get to the bottom of this. People might shrug this off and say, yeah, it's just five grand. It's not a big deal. And don't worry, we're going to keep a close eye on those billion dollar spending problems too. But the simple truth is is that little things add up and we need governments to do the big things right, but we also need governments to do the little things right. And especially right now, we need to see our politicians and our government bureaucrats treating every single taxpayer dollar with respect. All right, coming up next... Conservative Party picked Aaron O'Toole as their new leader. We're going to talk about what that means for taxpayers. Stay with us. It's time for Deep Dive. And that's when we get deeper into important issues in Canada. And here's an important issue for you. Because the Conservative Party of Canada just picked Aaron O'Toole as its new leader. And Todd, you interviewed O'Toole not too long ago on the show, um, and that was during the leadership race. So so let's talk about what O'Toole promised and what his victory means for taxpayers. Yeah, so I mean, when you look at an opposition leader, there's often a lot of talk, not a lot of action for the simple fact that the opposition leader is in opposition, not in government. So you often have to wait a little while to see what happens with a lot of those promises. But Aaron O'Toole made a promise to taxpayers that he can keep right now. He can start on it today while he's still in opposition. Let me read you a social media post he put out on May 23rd. Quote, Canadians have sacrificed enough. 
They shouldn't have to pay for wage subsidies for political parties. Under my leadership, the Conservative Party will not take the subsidy and over time will repay the amount it has taken. I call on other parties to do the same. In that quote, that's O'Toole talking about the 75% wage subsidy that the federal government is giving to businesses so that they can keep their employees on staff, so that they can keep their workers on the job during this shutdown. And let's get one thing straight. That was meant for struggling Canadians. But all of the major federal parties, with the exception being the Bloc, have applied for this money. And that cost so far is, is just shy of $2 million for taxpayers. And the CPC has helped themselves to more than $700,000 of that. Now, right away, we at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation knew we had to fight this. We knew we had to blow the whistle. And our supporters have been absolutely blasting the CPC leadership candidates. And because our supporters have just been applying the pressure, O'Toole responded and he promised that the CPC, if he became leader, would stop taking the money and would pay it back. And of course, on a lot of provinces, like I said, we'll have to wait and see how how O'Toole does if and when he becomes prime minister. But we don't have to wait on this promise. The Conservative Party of Canada shouldn't be taking this subsidy. It shouldn't be in the taxpayer's trough. Neither should any other party. Aaron O'Toole promised to get his party out of it if he became leader. He's now the leader. Time to get down to it. Don't wait. Start today. He can start building credibility for his other promises by keeping this promise and giving back that subsidy immediately. And uh, here's another big promise that I think uh, taxpayers are going to love. So O'Toole signed the Canadian Taxpayers Federation's pledge to get rid of the federal carbon tax. And here's what he said when he signed the pledge before the debate. We're going to roll the clip right now. I appreciate the CTF's work uh, for taxpayers on carbon tax and really on tax competitiveness. When I was elected seven years ago, I came from the private sector. Uh, I worked for a company that was a manufacturer in Ontario, and I saw how uncompetitive the carbon tax was, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses. So let's be clear about what that pledge is. That pledge is a promise to scrap the federal carbon tax and reject any future carbon tax or cap-and-trade scheme. Listen, we've got O'Toole's signature on this. It's in black and white. He's signed on the dotted line. We're going to be watching this very carefully. Okay, so we talked about O'Toole's promise to pay back the federal wage subsidy and his promise to scrap the Trudeau carbon tax. Those are both important. Um, But Todd, you interviewed all of the conservative leadership candidates for the show, and you spent about a half an hour putting questions to O'Toole. So what else from the conversation you had with O'Toole stands out for you? You know, I asked O'Toole about the Trudeau government's gun buyback and ban. Uh, It's going to cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars likely to go north of a billion dollars. It's hard to imagine that it will actually make Canadians safer. O'Toole gave a pretty interesting answer based on his experience in the Canadian forces. Check that out. I have fired a military assault rifle when I was in the military. You cannot buy uh, military assault weapons in Canada. In fact, they use those terms to mislead people and to scare people who don't understand our regime. O'Toole also had some pretty interesting things to say about simplifying the tax code, and he even pointed to some flaws in his own party's past policies. Here's what he had to say. Look, Conservatives, we've even been involved in complicating things with some of our our tax credits. And while they were always for valid things, I saw in Ottawa that, that that just encouraged more groups to pattern their issue as a boutique credit. And so what about we just simplify everything? That way you're not coming for a specific solution, but we're saying, hey, we want you to generally over time keep a lot more of your own money. And we know that that will have dividends by investment, expansion, uh, purchasing power. I'm, I'm a firm believer in a more simplified, lower tax code, making us competitive in a global economy. Listen, I think we're all in favor of simplifying the tax code. I don't think anybody gets done their tax and thought, man, I wish there was a few more pages, a few more boxes to check. Could I just do one more calculation? I don't think anybody feels that way. So it's good to see uh, O'Toole talking about doing what needs to be done in terms of simplifying the tax code. But I was pretty disappointed with O'Toole's response on another critical question. So the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is working with a courageous Indigenous activist named Charmaine Stick. Her band, 
the Onion Lake Cree Nation refuses to publish its annual financial statements as required by the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. Mm -hmm. The band is getting away with that because the Trudeau government isn't enforcing the legislation. So I asked O'Toole what he'd do to help Charmaine if he becomes prime minister. Here's that exchange. Justin Trudeau isn't helping Charmaine Stick get transparency in her community. If you're prime minister, what would you do to help Charmaine Stick? Well, perhaps Charmaine can be one of the, the members of the board of this uh, First Nation-led transparency initiative. As I said, I think her voice and, and my friend Kathy McLeod, uh, an MP from Kamloops, have, has talked about her in the House of Commons, and she's, she's a very strong and resolute figure, and I admire the fact that she's been working with you. That's the type of leadership we need to have a governance model, because I've talked to First Nation leaders, and they always say that some of the outliers that don't want to comply Oh, they think it's a, an Ottawa knows best, or it's an attack on nation to nation dialogue, these sorts of things. This is why there is capacity in terms of governance within First Nation uh, leaders, chiefs, uh, business leaders, development corporations to monitor themselves. That way we take away this excuse that, oh, this is the Stephen Harper Accountability Act. It's only the bad apples that won't comply. So if we remove the sort of Ottawa politics from it and say, look, this is gonna be a governance initiative that's not just providing accountability, we wanna see the best practices in terms of financial transparency and oversight, both for on-reserve uh, initiatives and related development corporations, so that the members of the communities like Charmaine knows that there's accountability and then it can be just taken for granted. So I, I want to really see it be, uh, be led in many ways by Indigenous Canadians. So I'm very much a Ottawa get out of the way at times. Let's set up uh, a, a body that will succeed. It will remove an excuse for non-compliance. And perhaps Charmaine can be one of the first, uh, first board appointments. So my takeaway there was that O'Toole wouldn't commit to enforcing the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. He wants to work with Indigenous leaders, create new governance models. And listen, of course, we all have to work together. And so much change needs to come from First Nations communities. That's all important. But listen, when the Canadian Taxpayers Federation pushed for the First Nations Financial Transparency Act, that push was led by Indigenous activists such as Phyllis Sutherland, from the Pegasus First Nation in Manitoba. The overwhelming majority of bands already provide this transparency. We have activists like Charmaine Stick standing up to defend the legislation. This is coming from First Nations communities. So we need to push O'Toole to do more than talking about maybe sometimes thinking about a new model of something. We need to push him to stand up with courageous activists like Charmaine Stick and to commit to enforcing the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. You know, right there, that's why it's so important for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation to be nonpartisan. Because yeah, politicians have some good ideas, but I think we all know that every politician has some bad ideas. And we need to make sure that they're delivering on the good stuff that they promise. And we need to get them back on track when they're heading in the wrong direction. But let's get back to the issue we opened with, and that's O'Toole promising that the CPC would stop helping itself to the federal wage subsidy if he became leader. So it's now time for the Conservative Party to take its snout out of the taxpayer trough and pay back the wage subsidy. And we've got a petition demanding an end to political parties using that subsidy. So please sign it. Please share it with your friends, your family, and your neighbors. And let's get more Canadian taxpayers in this fight. And most importantly, let's make sure O'Toole starts things off right by keeping his promise to taxpayers. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. When we started this podcast, we honestly didn't know if anyone would listen, but now we're getting thousands of downloads each week. So first, thanks for listening. And second, I got a favor to ask. We want to know what you would do to make this podcast even better. We've got a link to a survey in the show notes.
It's anonymous, and it'll only take a few minutes to fill out. And I guarantee it'll help us make a better podcast. So please, go to the show notes, hit the link for the survey. Thanks again for listening. Okay, now back to the show. It's time for Waste Watch. This part's funny or infuriating, depending on how you look at it, because we're going to talk about dumb things that governments are spending your money on. Franco, what are we talking about today? Yeah, well, I think it's an understatement to say we've had some crazy spending stories coming out of Ottawa lately. But I want to dig into something specifically, and that's spending by the Governor General that I think is going to make some taxpayers' blood boil. So Governor General Julie Payette has been in the media for nearly a month here. There's all kinds of problems uh, with her staff, but this is a taxpayers' podcast. Give us the details about the money. Well, apparently Miss Payette wanted a little more privacy at Rideau Hall in Ottawa, and that's uh, where the Governor General is supposed to live. She wanted a private staircase along with a gate and new doors to keep people out of her office. You know, I, I kind of get it. I got four kids. I'm working from home. You can probably hear them in the background here sometimes while we're recording the podcast. So I get it. It's nice to have a little space with nobody bugging you. Well, hundreds of thousands of dollars for more privacy? Yeah, that's a tough pitch. And it gets worse. The CBC asked the National Capital Commission about that staircase, and it says the NCC spent $140,000, but it was never actually built. So they shelled out six figures so some people could study and make designs for a staircase. And remember that gate and new doors that I mentioned earlier? Well, CBC says those cost just over $117,000. So all these demands were made, all this extra money spent. And according to media reports, the governor general still hasn't actually moved into the place yet. And here's what a spokesperson for Ms. Payette had to say, quote, to date, outstanding issues regarding universal accessibility and privacy in the space provided in Rideau Hall for the governor general have not yet been addressed. In this day and age, the interest in this seems contrary to respecting the life and privacy of a person. Yeah, okay, listen. Ms. Payette is welcome to all of the personal privacy she wants. But her use of taxpayers' money, that's not private. Taxpayers are owed an answer here. It seems the Governor General has also racked up quite a bill for her RCMP protection detail. Apparently, Ms. Payette likes to uh, sneak away, ditch her security detail, and the RCMP had to hire an extra cop for her international trips just to keep an eye on her door. In fact, CBC is reporting that Ms. Payette's security costs last year are $700,000 higher than they were for the previous Governor General. So what you're saying is basically taxpayers are paying for an overpriced and overtrained babysitter because the governor general likes to play hide and seek with their security detail. And that's not even the end of the story. CBC is reporting the RCMP had to double or triple the price they pay for flights because of last minute bookings that cost taxpayers thousands of dollars. There's also records of $400 for a hotel room in Quebec City that was never even used. It just seems to be waste all over the place here. And the position of Governor General has a long tradition of wasting taxpayers' money. And this is one of my favorite times here. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation gives out an award to politicians and bureaucrats who waste our tax dollars on the craziest things. And we call these the Teddy Waste Awards. Well, last year, we gave former Governor General Adrian Clarkson a Lifetime Achievement Teddy Waste Award for soaking taxpayers, get this, even in retirement. So yeah, we all know that politicians like to burn us, but they usually do that while they're actually elected officials. The former governor general, well, she continued to do that in retirement because for about a decade, Clarkson billed taxpayers more than $100,000 almost every single year since 2005. And here's the kicker. She retired in 2005. So yeah, it's crazy. She was getting reimbursed for expenses even after she retired. What's the point of retiring if you're still getting your expenses covered? It doesn't make any sense. It's a crazy story, and it's all because of some dumb 40-year-old policy that allows governor generals to keep submitting expenses even after they leave the job. 
and the public doesn't even get to see the full details of the expenses. So last summer, the National Post reported that the prime minister wanted to actually take a look at that policy. He's like, listen, this is an old policy, it needs to get worked out. The Privy Council Office, which is a bureaucratic arm of the Prime Minister's Office, provided a statement that says, quote, further to the Prime Minister's comment, a review of the former Governor's General Program has begun and it's expected to be completed at the end of the summer. They weren't talking about this summer, they were talking about last summer. That was a year ago. So we're filing a stack of access to information requests to find out what happened to that. This policy makes me nuts. If it makes you crazy, head over to taxpayer.com. We've got a petition calling on an end to the governor general's expensing taxpayers even after they've walked away from the job. You know, I gotta say, winning a lifetime waste award is tough enough as it is. I mean, you really have to go out of your way to waste some serious taxpayer dough. But Clarkson has accomplished the uh, almost unthinkable. The award we gave Clarkson last year was her second lifetime Teddy Waste Award. She received her first Waste Award back in 2004 for blowing a crazy amount of tax dollars on trips. And now here's just one example. When she traveled to Victoria in 1999, the Governor General opted for the lavish Empress Hotel in Victoria over Government House. I guess Government House just wasn't good enough for her. But get this, Government House was good enough to host the Queen in 1994. So why wasn't it good enough for the Queen's representative only a few years later? Honestly, sounds kind of like a diva to me. So Clarkson really took an office that really should be a, a pinnacle of respect in our system of government. She just treated it like uh, with complete contempt. And, you know, we're going to follow the Payette saga as well, the new edition of this story, and hold her feet to the fire if she continues to waste more taxpayers' money. Our investigative reporter, James Wood, He's filing a ton of A-tips to get more details on all of this spending by the Governor General and her office. You're going to hear more about this in the future. I think that's a pretty sure bet. Check taxpayer.com. You're going to see it there. You're going to see more of it in the podcast as well. Thanks for listening to the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. And James Wood, you edit it. You try to make us sound sort of kind of good. Thanks a lot for doing that. And everyone out there, please subscribe, like, share, and review our show. It really helps us get the word out to more people and more taxpayers. And of course, thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening. And thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.